Well, the first thing I would say is that what distinguishes LaRouche and our organization, our fight internationally from any one else virtually on the scene is that we intend to succeed because it's clear that the survival of mankind depends on these policies. This is not a protest. We are not a protest group. We are not a minority voice. The policies that we are discussing, Obama's removal, the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, a credit system, the space program, are absolutely necessary if mankind is to survive. And when you're in a fight for victory, then there's a different mindset. Like what Leandra is saying, it's different. You don't just sign a petition. There were a lot of German military officers who thought that Hitler was nuts. They thought he was crazy to invade Poland. And some of them even wrote a letter to Hitler saying that he was crazy. So they could be on record opposing his policy. But they didn't actually stop him from doing it. So the question for us is, how can we organize ourselves, our thinking, our identities, out of this stupid, pessimistic, rotten culture to actually win? And so what I wanted to take up is the question of courage, because although with what Elliot went through, you'd say, well, this is so obvious. Why would anyone be afraid to present it? I mean, I'm not afraid. I'll go talk to the congressman. I'll go do this. But of course, if this, if this were like popular opinion, if all your neighbors agreed with this, we wouldn't be in this mess, would we? So actually what's going to happen is everyone sets out to organize and have different fights is you're going to run into opposition and you're going to find moments where um, your best friend, your next door neighbor, your wife, your husband, your sister <laughs> doesn't agree and doesn't get it. Uh, so I wanted to look at this a little bit so we could try and figure it out and hopefully everyone will leave this room <laughs> a much more courageous, confident fighter than you were when you came in. Um, so on the really mundane, stupid level, I was just thinking of a few things. How many times have you been in a conversation with someone where you, after the fact, really regretted that you didn't tell them the truth about something? And it can be a really simple little thing. Like, suppose your boss has a big piece of spinach hanging out of her mouth. <laughs> Well, in a private conversation, you might say, you know, I'm not really on good terms with my boss, and I want her to know that I respect her, and so I don't think I'm really going to bring this up right now, and she'll go to the bathroom at some point and notice it, and we won't have to deal with it. Well, if you knew that she was about to give a press conference to 20 press because the company that she is running was trying to move into a new area, and wanted to make a favorable impression, you might find the courage <laughs> to say, you know, I think you should get rid of that piece of spinach hanging off the corner of your mouth before you go in front of all those cameras. <laughs> so what's the difference? Well, in the second case, you're actually thinking of a particular consequence that of all the things that could happen, what if your boss goes out in front of 20 cameras, has this big piece of spinach hanging there, and the reporters make fun of it, and the town you're trying to move into says, oh my, you know, forget it, they're crazy, this person doesn't wipe her mouth when she eats, and blah, blah, blah. So you, you're, you're imagining all of these potential future scenarios, and you say, you know, this is really not acceptable, so I'm not going to let this happen, so I'm going to have a moment of discomfort and tell my boss that she has to, you know, straighten out her appearance. <laughs> um, so, and I think, you know, most people who are here today are here because you already are a leader, because you've already come up against popular opinion, or you've had certain arguments, or you disagree with what you see in the media. Um, 
but the question is what about really serious cases? Because that's a very short term, that's a kind of stupid example, but what about the question of having a sensuous grasp of what's going to happen in the future and being so passionately connected to that that it drives your actions in the present because you're just as passionate that you can imagine what will happen if a giant asteroid hits this planet. That that becomes something very real for you and you say, you know what, this is not acceptable. Or conversely, and I think ironically, the passion for the good is sometimes even harder to access. What if you have the idea that all of these children today, instead of growing up and shooting other children, should become Albert Einstein and Beethoven and we should have done what was Werner von Braun was outlining, that we should have been on Mars in you know, 1987, but we should be there 20 years from now. What do you say, you know what, I have a really noble mission for mankind. And I think human beings really have not nearly reached their true potential. And all of these conflicts that we see, these are like childhood diseases of mankind. And so you have a passion that you say, Something has to be done because mankind is better than this. And, and that becomes a sensuous part of your identity. So I wanted to take um, three of my friends. Uh, one is an older friend, and two of them are friends that I've made recently. Um, <laughs> one of my older friends uh, that people may be f familiar with is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain who, like myself, is from the state of Maine, and who um, also was a choir director and a theologian, and was, became a very, very important general in the Civil War. And in fact, he was chosen ultimately at the end of the war by Abraham Lincoln to receive the surrender of the Confederate troops because Lincoln's very great concern <coughs> was that the nation had to prosper and therefore he had to find a general who was not going to degrade or humiliate the Confederate forces who had also sacrificed a great deal even if their cause was wrong they had fought with a passion with a certain amount of courage and they were valuable citizens in a republic so Chamberlain really embodied that and one of the key moments was when he had barely joined the, the war. And it's ironic, you know, here he is this theology and linguistics and musician professor, and he decides he just can't stand it. He has to get involved in the war. So he starts reading all these books on military, <laughs> whatever. He didn't have any training. And um, was in a very hideous battle early on in Fredericksburg. But anyway. Um, <clears throat> At Gettysburg, and many of you probably know this, um, what happened to the 20th Maine is that you had Lee, and what was going on before Gettysburg is that the French and the British were about to recognize the Confederacy. They were just looking for one crucial battle, one crucial turn. It wasn't even that, that the Confederacy had to win. What they were looking for is suppose that Lee could capture a northern city like Gettysburg. Support, suppose the South was able to come in from the north and take Gettysburg. That would be enough for France and England to recognize the South as a nation and to aid them in the war against the United States. So this was known to Chamberlain, this was known to the Union soldiers that this battle was not any other battle that we could not afford to lose because losing this battle most likely meant that we would lose the war because you'd have two more nations coming in to aid the Confederacy. Now I just have to say here because another thing that people may not know which is worth knowing is at that time um, Tsar Alexander II in Russia sent the Navy he sent a fleet to New York, he sent a fleet to San Francisco, and he made it known that if the British were to enter the war on the side of the Confederacy, 
that Russia was going to enter the war on the side of the Union and that Russia was also going to attack them in Europe. And this is very important when you think there's all of our relations with other nations are complex and like the United States, in every nation there are different strains of history which we can choose to relate to or not. So anyways, um, they were going into this battle and they get the word that the skirmishing had broken out and Chamberlain is such an incredible writer because of his uh, background. So I just wanted to read you a little bit so you get this is something he wrote later for Harper's Magazine about the battle. And they just got the word in the middle of the night they had sat down to rest and they, and they heard no we can't rest we have to march all night we have to get there. And so they're marching in the middle of the night. And uh, here is the description. He said, word was coming too. Staff officers dashed from corps to division to brigade to regiment to battery. And the order flew like the hawk and not the owl to Gettysburg. It said a forced march of 16 miles. But what forced it and what opposed? Not supper nor sleep nor sore feet and aching limbs. In a moment, the whole corps was in marching order. Rest, rations, earth itself forgotten, one thought to be first on that Gettysburg road. The iron-faced veterans were transformed to boys. They insisted on starting out with colors flying so that even the night might know what manner of men were coming to redeem the day. All things, even the most common, were magnified and made mysterious by the st strange spell of the night. At a turn of the road, a staff officer with an air of authority told each colonel as he came up that McClellan was in command again and riding ahead of us on the road. McClellan had been sacked by Lincoln because he would never fight, but he had such honor and presence that everyone suddenly imagined that he was back leading. He was not, he was not there, right? Then wild cheers rolled from the crowded column into the brooding sky, and the earth shook under the quickened tread. Now from a dark angle of the roadside came a whisper, whether from earthly or unearthly voice, one cannot feel quite sure that the august form of Washington had been seen that afternoon at sunset riding over the Gettysburg Hills. Let no one smile at me, I half believed it myself. So did the powers of the other world draw nigh. So this was their night long march. And what happened is they got there and luckily, um, Governor Warren had observed that Little Round Top had no one on it. And the Alabama and other regiments from the south were coming up to Little Round Top. And he quickly said, the 20th Maine has to go there. And what you have to do is hold, that's the end of the line. Because it went from Little Round Top all the way this way. They were at the far left, however you want to look at it. And, um, he said to Chamberlain, no matter what happens, you cannot, because if this collapsed, if the flank collapsed, then the Confederate Army would come around behind and they would roll up the Union Army, and that would be the end of that battle. So here was this guy, you know, a university professor who had been in like one other battle um, with his 20th Maine told you are the flank, you have to hold this line. And what happened was Alabama and all and Texas and mostly Alabama, thousands began marching up the hill and 20th Maine was shooting and shooting and their lines were getting thinner and thinner and they had to keep trying to uh, move to replace people and Chamberlain describes a scene where at one moment he looked up and the entire Union line had broken and all that was there was one 18-year-old boy holding the flag. And he said, I don't know why the Confederates did not rush through at that point except like myself. They may have been so astounded at the scene of this young man holding the Union flag that they couldn't bring themselves to break through. And then what happened is, of course, Chamberlain's forces ran out of ammunition. They ran out of ammunition. They had no more firepower. And they looked down, and there's 3,000 more troops coming up the hill. 
And I think it actually came from a book, which is very funny because this wasn't a training, but Chamberlain remembered in some battle this idea of this flank of a, like a rotating wheel. And the only thing he could think of as he said, fix bayonets. We are going to take our bayonets, we're going to form into this wheel, and we're going to charge down the hill 400 soldiers against 3,000. And it's, it's all we can do. We have nothing less. We have to win. We cannot lose the flank. And so what they did was they fixed bayonets, let out a huge roar, went charging down the hill. And it was such a terrifying sight that most everybody surrendered immediately. A guy pulled his gun on Chamberlain, and Chamberlain had his bayonet right at the guy's throat. And the guy said, I surrender. So Chamberlain was able to grab both of that guy's guns, which he said he needed later because they were fully loaded. <laughs> but they ended up pushing back the force, and he said it was such a momentum he couldn't get his soldiers back. They wanted to keep chasing the Confederates all the way, but he, he got them back. And then, you know, the next day was a whole other story. But, I mean, this, that, why? Why would you, do, against all odds, I mean, if you t went to statistics and you said, well, what are the odds that some ragtag group of guys who were up all night marching are going to hold back thousands of troops when they run out of ammunition. That's not a battle likely to be won, but it was the spirit and courage of Chamberlain. There's just one other thing I want to share with you from there, which I just particularly really like. This is a letter that Chamberlain got later. Um, Dear Sir, I want to tell you of a little passage in the Battle of Round Top Gettysburg concerning you and me, which I am now glad of. Twice in that fight, I had your life in my hands. <laughs> I got a safe place between two rocks and drew bead fair and square on you. You were standing in the open behind the center of your line, full exposed. I knew your rank by your uniform and your actions, and I thought it a mighty good thing to put you out of the way. I rested my gun on the rock and took steady aim. I started to pull the trigger, but some queer notion stopped me. Then I got ashamed of my weakness and I went through the same motions again. I had you perfectly certain. But that same queer something shut right down on me. I couldn't pull the trigger and I gave it up. That is your life. I am glad of it now and hope you are. <laughs> <laughs> Yours truly. <laughs> so anyway, that I think is just amazing. Then the next example, someone I'm just beginning to know more, uh, Douglas MacArthur. And what his courage actually was shown in an extraordinary way, not only in combat, but in a particular battle he had to get permission to carry out the Inchon landing. And this was crucial because um, what had happened was that a general, I think it's General Walker, had 100,000 troops in part of the Korean Peninsula, but the North Koreans had blocked him off. And the North Koreans we're having a great time getting all their supplies back and forth. And MacArthur was watching this and seeing our soldiers on the southern part just being cut off, constricted, nothing. And plus, MacArthur, like LaRouche, like this organization, he wasn't in the war for play. He didn't think we should have perpetual wars. He thought we should win the wars. You win, you fight to win, you get it over with, you have the minimum loss of life, and you organize your former enemies to be your allies. But, uh, so what happened? He figured out that there was a way to cut off the North Korean supply lines. And that if we could cut off the North Korean supply lines, we could make short work of this, we could save these 100,000 Americans that were just getting wiped out through attrition. And the way to do this would be at Incheon. So a, uh, he proposes it to Washington, and he says, after a silence of three weeks, the Joint Chiefs of Staff wired me that General Joseph Collins, Army Chief of Staff and Admiral Forrest Sherman, Chief of Naval Operations, were coming to Tokyo to discuss this maneuver with me. 
So they're going to have a war council to discuss MacArthur's proposal. And he said, just like in Pearl Harbor, when Roosevelt and Nimitz met in 1944, the Navy presented its case first. So what was the case from the Navy? They said that the rise and fall of the tides at Inchon at 20.7 feet was one of the greatest of the world, that the tides were 30 feet, that when the tide went out, you had as much as two miles of mud, that the length of time that a boat could navigate this channel was only two hours, and that this would be virtually impossible to bring all of our men, all of our supplies in there, get them off the boats, and get the boats out of there in a two-hour period. So the argument of the Navy was that this was just a preposterous proposal. And similarly, General Collins presented his arguments. He said that the Army Chief of Staff felt that Inchon was too far in the rear. It wasn't really a good place. We shouldn't do it here. Uh, so every single superior to MacArthur got up and made a speech of why this should not be done and why it was not going to work. And he says, uh, I waited a moment or so to collect my thoughts. I could feel the tension rising in the room. Almond shifted uneasily in his chair. If ever a silence was pregnant, this one was. I could almost hear my father's voice telling me, as he had so many years ago, Doug, councils of war breed timidity and defeatism, which is what they were all discussing, right? Can't be done, can't be done, won't work, won't work. So he then speaks for half an hour. I'm not going to give you the whole speech. But he says, the only alternative to a stroke such as I propose will be the continuation of the savage sacrifice we are making at Pusan with no hope of relief in sight. Are you content to let our troops stay in that bloody perimeter like beef cattle in the slaughterhouse? Who will take the responsibility for such a tragedy? Certainly not I. And then he talks about Asia and the importance of winning this battle for, the, for Europe, etc. And he says, uh, make the wrong decision here, the fatal decision of inertia, and we will be done. I can almost hear the ticking of the second hand of destiny. We must act now or we will die. If my estimate is inaccurate and I should run into a defense with which I cannot cope, I will be there personally, I will immediately withdraw, etc. So they agree. Finally, they agree, okay, you can do this. So, but they can only do it because the longest period of the highest tides is a very specific day in September. So they get everyone, they start getting the forces in, they get the whole thing lined up, they're ready to launch, and he gets a cable from Washington that says, you know, we really don't think this is going to work, and maybe you shouldn't do it. And he's, I mean, they're ready to go, so he actually scribbles a handwritten note um, saying, uh, I am totally confident that this is going to work. <laughs> Uh, and, and then they wait, and he gets word back, okay, you can do it. So uh, then he describes uh, what happens that night. Um, it's very similar to the Chamberlain. All over the ship, the tension that had been slowly building up since our departure was now approaching its climax. Even the Yellow Sea rushing past the ship's side seemed to bespeak the urgency of our mission. That night, about half past two, I took a turn around the deck. The ship was blacked out from stem to stern. At their posts and battle stations, the crew members were alert and silent, no longer exchanging the customary banter. At the bow, I stood listening to the rush of the sea and watched the fiery sparklets of phosphorescence as the dark ship plowed on toward the target. Within five hours, 40,000 men would act boldly in the hope that 100,000 others manning the thin defense lines in South Korea would not die. I alone was responsible for tomorrow, and if I failed, the dreadful results would rest on judgment day against my soul. So that was MacArthur's approach. So you could ask, what actually took more courage carrying out this mission or that war council meeting where every single one of his superiors laid out 
And these weren't frivolous arguments. What the Navy was saying was absolutely true. This was, quote unquote, impossible, supposedly. And he took it upon himself to say, I will bear the responsibility for this because we, this has to be won. Now, my last case, um, because we also have to find some women <laughs> in these situations. Uh, and this really struck me as being very similar. Um, Frances Perkins, uh, who was in the Franklin Roosevelt administration and was there right from the beginning in the first 100 days. And when FDR came in, he had a crazy cabinet. And he himself, he had been really transformed by his battle with polio because he came from an oligarchical family. But after the polio, he completely changed his outlook, particularly on people who were less fortunate. And he did not have this, you know, arrogant edge of his class. Um, but he had all these funny ideas, like one, he knew that people urgently had to get back to work, but he also thought that they should really cut the budget and, and cut all spending. So he brought this cabinet in, which had all these wild people. You had Wall Street, you know, budget cutting, really, you know, crazy people wanted to cut all the veterans, better benefits, cut, cut, cut everything. Then he had other people like Francis Perkins, um, who argued for the, the public works. And, and some people thought he liked to just watch everybody argue <laughs> and then try and figure out what was the best way to go. But anyways, what happened was that they had a huge fight um, on this question of public works. Uh, and what happened was finally FDR conceded that it was going to be in his bill and they had a big fight they she and others thought it should be five billion dollars he said no they finally agreed on 3.3 .3 billion um and she says that she discovered then when the bill was about to be presented that the public works part had disappeared was no longer in the bill so she found out on Friday, she says, that the $3.3 .3 billion program that had been agreed to was no longer in the bill. It had been dropped so quietly that even uh, Wagner, who would be introducing, the guy who's going to introduce the bill, didn't even know it had been taken out. Um, the omission was not entirely surprising. Even after he gave his approval, Roosevelt had remained ambivalent about the public works provision. Perkins suspected that Douglas, Douglas was the Wall Street guy, had lobbied behind the scenes for its removal and Roosevelt had acquiesced. When she investigated, she quickly learned that her suspicions were correct. Douglas had met privately with Roosevelt and persuaded him to put the public works in a separate bill, intending to kill it later. Perkins was indignant that Douglas had not acted on the right. He agreed and then went around behind everyone's back, met with the president, got this taken out of the bill. Um, so she said to herself, I know as much about what the president thinks as you do. And she called up Roosevelt's office and made an appointment to go sit, go see the president. And she checked with the secretary and found out sure enough that Douglas had a meeting with Roosevelt that morning. Uh, so it says she stayed up all night to prepare for the meeting. She brought along Wisansky, the labor department's top lawyer to help make the case. At the meeting, she repeated her familiar arguments for public works, insisting it would benefit not just the unemployed, but the entire country, uh, et cetera. Uh, she said, you've got to decide it right now, Mr. President. Here on this beautiful, sunshiny afternoon, we have to decide if we shall put it in or leave it out. So finally, he agrees to do it. But she, and again, it's this victory question, she knows that that is not sufficient. She makes him call Wagner, the guy who's going to introduce the bill, while she is sitting there in his office to make sure that Wagner puts the public works section in the bill. And that is the reason why FDR did the public works. So, I mean, that's what it actually 
takes, okay? And you have to, therefore, and everyone who's been with us on some of these trips to Washington, you know it's very funny because you get to the congressman's office and they say, oh, no, no, oh, you had a meeting. Oh, the congressman is not in. And then you hang out in the hall and lo and behold, the congressman pops out from one of the rooms. You know, it's, um, it, this is not <laughs> unusual. But I think the question to consider, again, what Elliot alluded to, and I think why, what is the difference? What is the difference between a good college try and what each of these people did? And where do you find the passion to put yourself on the line and take total personal responsibility for the result and to act to, with the knowledge that your life depends on it. Because it's easy to say that it does. But for most of us, most of the time, it's not in our gut that it does. And that's why people back off, don't say what they should say, don't act in history when they have to, and we are at a moment where we cannot afford to not act anymore. Um, so, and I think, you know, most people who are here today are here because you already are a leader, because you've already come up against popular opinion, or you've had certain arguments, or you disagree with what you see in the media. Um, but the question is, what about really serious cases? Because that's a very short term, that's a kind of stupid example, but what about the question of having a sensuous grasp of what's going to happen in the future, and being so passionately connected to that, that it drives your actions in the present because you're just as passionate that you can imagine what will happen if a giant asteroid hits this planet. That that becomes something very real for you and you say, you know what, this is not acceptable. Or conversely, and I think ironically, the passion for the good is sometimes even harder to access. What if you have the idea that all of these children today, instead of growing up and shooting other children, should become Albert Einstein and Beethoven. Bring this up right now, and she'll go to the bathroom at some point and notice it, and we won't have to deal with it. Well, if you knew that she was about to give a press conference to 20 press because the company that she is running was trying to move into a new area and wanted to make a favorable impression, you might find the courage <laughs> to say, you know, I think you should get rid of that piece of spinach hanging off the corner of your mouth before you go in front of all those cameras. <laughs> so what's the difference? Well, in the second case, you're actually thinking of a particular consequence that of all the things that could happen. What if your boss goes out in front of 20 cameras, has this big piece of spinach hanging there, and the reporters make fun of it, and the town you're trying to move into says, oh my, you know, forget it, they're crazy, this person doesn't wipe her mouth when she eats, and blah, blah, blah. So you, you're, you're imagining all of these potential future scenarios, and you say, you know, this is really not acceptable, so I'm not gonna let this happen, so I'm gonna have a moment of discomfort and tell my boss that she has to, you know, straighten out her appearance. <laughs> What's going to happen is everyone sets out to organize and have different fights is you're going to run into opposition and you're going to find moments where um, your best friend, your next door neighbor, your wife, your husband, your sister <laughs> doesn't agree and doesn't get it. Uh, so I wanted to look at this a little bit so we could try and figure it out and hopefully everyone will leave this room <laughs> a much more courageous, confident fighter than you were when you came in. Um, so on the really mundane, stupid level, I was just thinking of a few things. How many times have you been in a conversation with someone where you, after the fact, really regretted that you didn't tell them the truth about something. And it can be a really simple little thing, like 
suppose your boss has a big piece of spinach hanging out of her mouth. <laughs> well, in a private conversation, you might say, you know, I'm not really on good terms with my boss, and I want her to know that I respect her, and so I don't think I'm really going to. Well, the first thing I would say is that what distinguishes LaRouche and our organization, our fight internationally from anyone else virtually on the scene is that we intend to succeed because it's clear that the survival of mankind depends on these policies. This is not a protest. We are not a protest group. We are not a minority voice. The policies that we are discussing, Obama's removal, the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall, a credit system, the space program, are absolutely necessary if mankind is to survive. And when you're in a fight for victory, then there's a different mindset like what Leandra is saying, it's different. You don't just sign a petition. There were a lot of German military officers who thought that Hitler was nuts. They thought he was crazy to invade Poland. And some of them even wrote a letter to Hitler saying that he was crazy. So they could be on record opposing his policy. But they didn't actually stop him from doing it. So the question for us is, how can we organize ourselves, our thinking, our identities out of this stupid, pessimistic, rotten culture to actually win? And so what I wanted to take up is the question of courage because although with what Elliot went through, you would say, well, this is so obvious. Why would anyone be afraid to present it? I mean, I'm not afraid. I'll go talk to the congressman. I'll go do this. But of course, if this, if this were like popular opinion, if all your neighbors agreed with this, we wouldn't be in this mess, would we? So actually,